गुरुर् ब्रह्मा गुरुर् विष्णु गुरुदेव महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात तारा ब्रह्मा तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः आई बाव टू गॉड एज ब्रह्मा विष्णु एंड शिवा आई बाव टू माय गुरु एज द मैनिफेस्टेशन ऑफ ऑल दोस फॉर्म्स आई बाव टू माय गुरु इन ऑल ऑफ यू यू नो we think of krishna as a manifestation of vishnu we think of different saints as being manifestations of one aspect or another brahma vishnu and shiva are really not actual entities they've been created as entities in the imagination of people and so they can come to people in those forms but actually they are the different manifestations of om and when you hear om you can hear it in these three different levels the high tone is the brahma it takes more energy to get something going you notice that when you start your car it has to go a rev high then when it's maintaining its speed it's a lower sound and om too when it's being when it's maintaining things as they are maintaining the universe and its vishnu aspect then it's a steadier hum then when it's bringing everything to a close again at the end of a day of brahma um it's in shiva aspect the sound of om is uh the lower kind once i had this experience where first i heard it loudly the high then medium then low and this is why my guru explained we chant om 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 the higher one is the creative vibration the middle the sustaining one the lowest the preserve the the uh, dissolving one and mind you these are working all the time simultaneously just as the three gunas are always present so the three aspects of om are always active in different aspects of human life when i meditate on my great guru paramahansa yogananda I can't help thinking that he manifested all three. Sometimes I would see him extraordinarily creative. He was a very creative individual and everything that he did, he always looked at it and saw how could I improve it? How could I do it in the best possible way? He had the common sense, his feet were on the ground, he could maintain things. He didn't have a sudden burst of energy and then fiddle, fade out as so many people do. And then if he had to destroy delusion in people he could be very fierce with people it's not that he ever destroyed people not that but he could very be very fierce in trying to help them to destroy their delusions in all of these aspects we see that as a human being i've never i in my life since knowing him i've never met a more perfect person he was perfectly human without having any of the human flaws we think oh i'm only human you can only say when you meet a master like that well i guess i'm not yet human because you see to be human means to explore your full potential you are made in a human form you're given this form after they say 5 to 8 million lifetimes it takes to reach the human level don't waste this opportunity you could fall back you could start over again if you if you blow it badly enough otherwise you remain in a human on the human plane usually if sometimes you may have to go down one life but not usually usually once you're a human being you remain that but what is that the purpose of being a human being is not to enjoy this plateau is to realize that i've got what i need now to begin to think for myself to begin to discriminate to begin to feel deeply and to understand that love is not just a physical expression it's something totally spiritual it's a yearning of the heart for a kind of union that can only be accomplished in god so i saw all these different aspects in him and even physically when he was young he was very strong and very fast and it was really a delight to to uh, hear stories about him of course when i came to him and he was he was in his later years i came in the last 
three and a half years of his life. But here in my book, um, Conversations with Yogananda, there's one delightful story. It was told to me by Kamala Silva, a disciple of the Masters who lived in Oakland, California, when I knew her. I want, went once with Master, she said, to the island of Santa Catalina, off the coast of Southern California. Master was a very fast runner when he was young. For our visit there, a young man accompanied us, who was a good athlete. When he heard that Master was a fast runner, he challenged him to a race. The young man himself ran in college competitions. Well, they started out even, but by the time the youth had finished the first block, Master had almost completed the second one. Sananda Ghosh, one of Yogananda's younger, younger brothers, told me Paramahamsaji had a very unusual style of running, as if slightly angled, but his legs moved like pistons, and he won every race. I was told that on the tennis court, also, the master was amazingly fast on his feet. I forget who told me, but that person said, Master just seemed to appear wherever the ball landed. I'm not sure that's fair. <laughs> One might have thought his movements were supernatural, but of course they weren't. How could they be for a mere game? The master himself told two of us the following story. We were at his desert retreat. There were some stray dogs at our ranchi school that caused a lot of trouble. One day they killed a horse. I decided they had to be captured and taken away. Taking up a few gunny sacks, I chased after them so quickly that I was able to seize them and put them one by one into those sacks. We took them far away, and they never returned. Here's an interesting part now. As he told this story, the master's speech, too, became very rapid. He was not only laughing merrily over the memory, but he acted out the episode with such animated gestures and facial expressions that acting, in, and the breath, that acting in the breathless way he told the story made me Miss much of what he said. After all, he had a strong Bengali accent also, but it was great fun listening to him. I'm sure he spoke longer than I've indicated here. Another person, as I've said, was present on that occasion. It was Laurie Pratt, his chief editor. Laurie maintained throughout the telling an air of almost disinvolvement. Well, well, was her somewhat distant comment when he finished. To me, it seemed as though she were thinking, this isn't the master I know. I've always remembered the contrast the three of us made in that relatively brief encounter. Master exuberantly reminiscing, Laurie Pratt somewhat distant and smiling only vaguely, if at all, and I myself laughing but not wholly understanding everything the master said. He was delighting in his reminiscences, but there was something about the whole scene that seemed to me almost surreal. Did he have a hidden purpose in telling me the story and in the exuberance he showed me in the telling? He spoke less clearly than when the two of us were speaking alone together. Of course he was reliving an exciting moment and communicated its drama successfully. It almost seemed, however, as if perhaps only by the rapidity with which he spoke he was deliberately garbling his English. I've often wondered about that occasion since then. It seems to me now to have been fraught with meaning. Was he subtly saying to Laurie, for, for instance, don't imagine that you've ever really known me. I am not who I seem to be. Was he saying to me, know me in your, for your own self and don't let anybody try to tell you who I am. Laurie, many years later, dealt me the severest test I have ever had to face in this lifetime. It began with her insistence that I didn't know the master at all, that she alone and others who agreed with her knew him. She said I would never be able to serve his work in the way he wanted. That occasion at his desert retreat was the only time the three of us were alone, ever alone together. Was the master merely relating an amusing and, let's face it, quite amazing story? rather incomprehensibly, incomprehensibly, excuse me. I cannot but think, as I look back on that occasion, that it should have held, and also did hold, 
a deep significance. For he must have known what the future held for Lori and me. Perhaps his message had to do with our attunement with him. Was he saying, perhaps more for her sake than for mine, I am not who you think I am? How subtle was his way of teaching. Often it wasn't even verbal. I soon came to realize in Laurie's and my relationship together as editors that although we were friends, we were also pulled apart in our perception of the Master's mission. He must have known these differences existed long before they surfaced, though he said nothing about them. He also spoke to me about Laurie in such a way as to ensure that I, was all, I would always hold her in high esteem though in later years she tested that esteem to the utmost. This is a fascinating subject. Because the present book concerns the Master, however, I cannot explore the theme further here nor offer any further comment. Yet I found it absolutely fascinating to see how differently the Master could be with different disciples and even when they were together and he would be in some subtle way he would convey a message to one person and not to another. I remember one time I was with a group of 100 people and he was lecturing and he said something that I knew was intended for me and I just in my heart felt grateful and he just looked at me with a sweet smile and then went on talking. He knew that I understood that I under, uh, uh, that he, uh, he understood that I understood that he understood. <laughs> and uh, the even the ability to run fast was just a part of his outward being, but his ability to go quickly through people's minds. He used to tell us that I go through your minds every night. You see, during the dream state, he worked on us more from within than from with words. Some people say, well, I don't need someone to tell me what to do. Well, probably you do if you say that. I certainly knew I needed it badly. But the point is that the real work of a guru is not through words. Words can be misunderstood. He would try to reach you from your own inward nature. And that in sleep, you're more uh, open. And so he can come to you in sleep. And many people have told me they dreamed things that he uh, said to them that were things they, I could see they needed. Sometimes even I've had this happen that people have told me they dreamed about me and that I said something, and it was something I had been wanting to say to them, but I wasn't conscious of coming to them in the way he was. He would go through everybody's mind consciously. He said, sometimes I'm so deep in a person that when I wake up, I think I am that person. He said, it can be a very terrible experience when you think of all the moods that people go through and so on. But what is the need for a guru? You can read everything in the Shastras, yes. You can misunderstand it, most certainly. But the thing is that the real guru influences you to understand, really. I'll never forget when I first felt a real glimmer of divine love. I just, it wasn't something, as I said the other day, I didn't need to take notes. It was, of course, Smithy. You remember, that's who you are. That's your real nature. Everybody is looking for love, and usually they try to push it into a corner or they become cynical about it or they think that it'll be found in a human being and it never is. The one you love most will be taken away from you. The one he loves most or she loves most will be taken away. And there can come misunderstandings that sometimes last a long time. I had a dream and I mentioned this in my book, The Path, the autobiography of a Western yogi it's been called. And uh, I wrote the book not about me, I don't care about me, but because I thought, well, if people can see who I am and see my character and my mistakes and so on, they be, they'll be able to filter that out when I talk about him and say, well, this is Kriyananda, and that, that must be Yogananda because it sure isn't Kriyananda. That kind of thinking was why I wrote the book. And uh, yet I also wrote it for another reason. When you read Autobiography of a Yogi, you're reading an autobiography that isn't an autobiography. It's about all these other great saints. So many people have told me here in India and elsewhere that uh, they have no idea what a master he was. They think he was this 
beautiful young man certainly comes across as beautiful. Just humble and sweet and all the beautiful human qualities, but they don't think of him as a master. They think he was this beautiful young man who had the opportunity to meet these great saints. He was greater than most of them. He was a great master, even from birth. And so I wanted to tell people who had read his autobiography what it was like to live with him, because he wouldn't tell about himself. He was so humble. I could talk about him. I remember I met a man in Boston, Massachusetts, many years ago, and uh, he told me, this was on our first country tour, cross-country tour, and he told me that, well, you know, I tried to read Autobiography of a Yogi and I just couldn't get into it. Well, it is understandable for two reasons. It's such a different world my guru lived in from the one most people live in. And it's different to the extent that on page 8, I think it is, Lahiri Mahashai materializes in a wheat field and scolds his disciple, Bhagavati, you are too hard on your employee. Well, you know, even I, after all, I had never read anything about the lives of saints, Western or Eastern. I had scoffed at them. This book did completely convert me. That change was sudden and yet total. I've never changed my mind in these 56 years. And yet, certainly I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't deny them because I believed him, but I couldn't understand them. I couldn't rationalize them to myself, and therefore I had to sort of put them on a shelf so I could understand why this man in Boston, why others that I have met here in India, they've told me frankly, they, they found his book a little hard to get into. They couldn't doubt his genuineness. They couldn't doubt his brilliance. They couldn't doubt his humility and human, humanly beautiful qualities. But what did you make of some of these things? You, they don't fit with your experience, so you have to put them on a shelf. Well, I told this man in Boston, I told it to other people here too, read my book first. It'll tell you what it was like to live with him. It'll tell you the kind of reasoning that can take one person, at least me, to the point where you realize there is no other answer. There is only God. And I came to him in desperation, I have to say. I couldn't see that anything else in this world could ever give me what I wanted. And so, after reading that book, I saw him a year later, and he said, well, now I can read the autobiography of a yogi, and I just love it. So I'm grateful that I performed this little service, because that book, to my mind, is the greatest book I have ever read, except great scriptures like the Bhagavad Gita, but this too is a great scripture, and it makes it dynamic to your present state of consciousness. So, look, here you are, we are all living in a world where there's so much variety. There's darkness, there's selfishness, there's kindness and sweetness and love. Don't worry about the darkness and don't worry about the meanness. When you see sweetness, when you see kindness, when you see beauty in people, cherish that. That is what this song is all about. Cherish these. Joy to you. Is there anywhere on earth perfect freedom, sorrows, dearth, selfless friendship, blameless birth? Cherish these, naught else has worth. Is there anywhere on earth perfect freedom, sorrows? Selfless friendship, blameless birth, cherished these, not else has worth. Is there 